Hello to all the listeners out there. Welcome to another episode of Banking on Experience. And today we've got a little bit of a special treat. Today we're going to be doing a fireside chat. Yep, that's right. We're going to have two guests. We're going to have the CEO of CRM Next and the CEO of ThinkStack. So stay tuned. We're going to be talking you ideas that you might be doing today. Welcome to the episode today. Um, I would like to introduce Joe Slusky from CRM Next. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, James. Thanks for having me. And welcome, Chris Sachs, CEO of ThinkStack. Thanks, James. Appreciate being here. So I got to ask both of you uh, an icebreaker question. Let's start with Chris, if that's okay. Uh, Chris, what is your favorite movie and why? Oh. I thought you were going to go there. So I, I love a lot of movies. I would say uh, We Were Soldiers, uh, which is probably not as popular, but it's a uh, Mel Gibson flick, but it's about uh, a general Hal Moore. And he is one of my favorite people um, as a leader. So I actually did my master's thesis on, on Hal Moore. And so I just love seeing the movie, not an exact representation, but pretty close um, and really highlights what being a leader is all about. Love it. Joe, different question. Who is your hero and why? Oh, wow. That is such a difficult question. But I think Leonardo da Vinci and Benjamin Franklin both fight it out for you, know, my, my true heroes. And, and I think really because they saw the world as it was, but as it could be and understood the intersection of art and technology and humanity. Um, and so I think both of them, you know, talked to the Renaissance of, at different points in, in history. And so I, I, you know, I, I think I always keep looking back at it. You know, da Vinci, probably my, the, the, the person that, you know, leads the stack, but Benjamin Franklin, uh, you know, on so many attributes, uh, you know, just a tremendous hero for, for the world, you know, and, uh, and our nation. And an inventor like yourself. So I like the fact that you brought that up. That makes total sense to me because I've actually, as long as we've known each other, I still didn't know that, uh, that, that answer. So um, let's, 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 I'd like for each of you to give the audience a little bit of an understanding of your knowledge around FIs. You both have a breadth of knowledge uh, across this industry. So I'd love for you to give you know, high level, what your experience is with financial institutions, how you've worked with them in the past. And if it's okay, let's start with Chris. Yeah, for sure. So this is uh, year 17 working in the, the FI space. Uh, early in my career, um, I got started with a small organization that did uh, firewalls. So this was early 2000s, before cybersecurity was a uh, term and uh, we were selling firewalls to a lot of organizations and obviously financial institutions were some of the first organizations that we focused on. And as I got to know um, those organizations began to really fall in love with FIs and technology and cybersecurity. Six years after I was introduced to them, was lucky enough to get out and start ThinkStack and we've been serving the technology and cybersecurity needs of you know banks and credit unions all around the country um, for the last 17 years, so. Love it, thank you, Chris. And Joe, what about you? So it's it's been a 35 year journey and you know one that I continue to wake up every day excited about. You know, I think financial services, I started my career um, reporting to the CFO at a very large insurance company um, and really understood at that time, we did the very first imaging system with Kodak, the very first networking to try to move towards paperless processing. And what I found was that financial services was really a home to innovation and that technology was really a fundamental, you know, brick in that foundation, you know, making sure that human capital was able to, to embrace change and handle the changing needs of organizations. So from that, the earliest days where we took out almost 65% of the OPEX changing the way we processed insurance claims, then really understanding that data was a strategic asset and looking how it could be harnessed
to create the products of the future and the work design and experience of the future really uh, paved the path. I, I found this little startup called Oracle, went there in the early days and helped uh, financial, financial community and then you know continued on. And I, I, I love to give a shout out to Dane Medina, who was a, an infrastructure guy at Wells Fargo in the very, very early days of the mobile phone, we had come up with technology to send alerts and do other types of data access, what you would think of as bots. And Dane was one of the people that really understood that the infrastructure needed to serve the customer in a different way. And, uh, you know, it's been a wonderful journey and it, it continues to be a terrific journey because I think technology continues to unlock the potential of humans to help each other. And I do believe, you know, banking you know, is what makes us the land of opportunity. That, you know, access to capital, you know, we have the most competitive banking environment in the world, um, but banking inclusion and access to capital really does make it possible, whether it's people accessing an education or starting a small business or getting a home, you know, it's an integral part of, you know, giving you opportunity and, and you know, from the healthcare side and others, we have places that we continue to need to lead transformation. Awesome. Joe, thanks for that. Chris, thank you for that. It's actually a pretty good segue into what we're going to be talking about. Um, listen, we're going to address an elephant in the room. There are leaders that are in this industry that are, that are going to be retiring. And there's a net new age of leaders that are going to be coming in, in, into their roles. And I want to talk about technology, process, and innovation. Um, they're all sometimes uh, on the side of what we'll call, that's how it's always been done before, okay? Um, so what's your first reaction to that response? And this time we're gonna start with Joe and we're gonna, then we're gonna go with Chris's response. Well, well, it's very interesting because I think across banking, you know, in particular, that's how it's done, been done before, um, hasn't really been the, the way that people have looked at it. If you look at innovation in the past 30 years in banking, whether it was ATMs or distributed systems in branch or e-commerce. So, you know, I think it has been, you know, an industry that has, has sought out and embraced change, you know, as a way of changing operating efficiencies, changing reach. Um, there's all sorts of great examples. So I think the past leaders have, have been embracing change, but really how intimate technology is in our life and the opportunity for products and services to be smarter over time is something that this next generation of leaders is really looking to, where technology is, is not just an assist, but is really the fulcrum, you know, to really lever up the benefits and of, you know, and the inclusion and the, the power of financial products over time. So I do think that the past leaders have, have left a foundation that the new leaders are really looking to accelerate off of. And uh, you're, you're gonna continue to see you know, uh, a shaping of things that are not, to, not necessarily technology driven, but human driven, you know, focused on the customer, but focused on really how, what is that next generation of products and services that people move forward on? Love it. Chris, any rebuttals and what's your thoughts on it? Yeah, trying to, you know, I, I think I partially agree with Joe on this one and, and, and partially don't. And what I mean by that is I think there's a tremendous amount of leadership who wants the change, wants the innovation and embraces those things. That having been said, I think where financial institutions in particular um, get into trouble for, as it relates to technology is no one, not, not no one, very few are willing to make the radical foundational changes to their technology and and everything that surrounds them in order for them to really get to this place that they want to be i think all the leadership identifies with this idea that transformational change is occurring at such a rapid pace that you need to have an organization that can pivot and move and adapt a piece of technology to change to the needs of the customer and the member i think where the where the challenge falls is being able to buy that piece of technology or build that piece of technology and then turning inward to your existing people process and technology and saying, hey guys, go plug this in, make this work. And unfortunately, we have antiquated 
core systems. We have antiquated networks. Only 10% of most FIs have embraced the cloud. So a lot of these organizations are really hamstrung by the infrastructure that continues to exist and are unwilling to come in and say, okay, we're going to rip everything out. We're going to move all of this to the cloud. We are going to shift our mindset as it relates to technology purchasing. We're going to sign shorter term contracts. We're not going to go all in with these behemoth organizations that kind of force us to buy their products like the old IBM model. We're going to build the organization and the technology footprint that our customers need for us and lead that. And I think there are some organizations starting to make that change, but those are radical, radical changes. And those oftentimes will cost a lot of money and sever some relationships that have been longstanding. And so I think we're there. I think the motivation is there, but I haven't seen the organizations follow through with what would be required on the back end in order for them to make this transformational changes. Chris, go ahead, Joe. Oh, go ahead. I, I was actually just going to comment because you know it's it's remarkable that the banks actually invented the cloud, that timeshare systems were created by banks, yep. um, so they could share resources for cores. So you know I I do think banks have out innovated a lot, you know, but it's been different systems, and you know part of the the negative inertia in banking is not because they're on one core system. But they're on multiple systems, and you know those systems have you know grown up you know a product at a time, a system at a time, and there is a desire to rationalize. But there's really been a, a missing system in financial services. The dis difference between a system of record and a system of interaction um, is you know sort of they've been glued together. So you've got these different systems that have been created by different people, and you know your knowledge of a customer, your ability to create products that have interlocking value has been missing. So, so I think it's, uh, you know, where, where I think Chris and I agree and disagree is, you know, the, 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 you know, how much inertia do they have and how much commitment is there to, you know, breaking loose of some of the challenges. And, you know, and I think most of them are looking for a solution, you know, that has been missing, you know, in terms of the tech stack and really, understanding that digital and assisted relationships are still just a relationship and that e-commerce and human-based commerce, you know, don't need separate platforms, but need an integrated. Yeah, system. Joe, let's, let's talk about, um, I, I'd love for each one of you to give kind of an experience that you've had um, where FIs have embraced this change and the outcome of embracing it. Uh, I'd love for you to talk about that. Let's start with Chris. Chris, you shared an experience with me when we were talking about doing this um, that I'd love for you, if you feel comfortable to share with the rest of the listeners on like, hey, like, look, this is an example. You don't have to give an organization's name out or anything like that, but this is an example of where, you know, you, you and your team got brought in to help make this change happen. Now I'm going to try to remember which example I gave <laughs> you, but I have a couple, so <laughs> hopefully it's in the same space. Um, you know, one of, one of my favorite uh, is a credit union we've been working with for about seven years. And they came in uh, really led by the CEO, who is not a technologist, but, you know, understood the, the importance of technology and innovation. And they came to us and brought us in and said, here is where I would like to get. I want to get to the point where I can build technology and buy technology based on the recommendations of my member service folks and my lending folks to be able to support the, ex the human experience that our credit union is trying to deliver to our members. And I need to build a technology footprint and a set of uh, processes and expertise in my organization that will support this ongoing evolution and, and change. So, we sat down with them with kind of that as the directive and, you know, obviously brought in many members of the organization and we started to just uncover what existed today and what would it take us to be able to get to this goal state. And as we uncovered it, they had, you know, two data centers. They had a lot of physical equipment, as you can imagine. Um, they had a fairly classic, I'll, I'll have the core remain nameless, but, a, you know, pretty classic uh, core system sitting in there. Uh, and then, you know, Joe, as you mentioned, a, a whole series of 
what I like to call the, the Frankenstein, you know, version of, of all these other ancillary products that, that supported that experience. So we ultimately built a three-year program for them that got them from where they were to where they wanted to be by year three. And in, in that three-year program looked at doing a, n- a number of things. One was for all the vendors that they needed to really shift to their hosted platforms, their shared platforms and cloud platforms. We started to move their compute and their storage, their existing things into the, into the public cloud using AWS and Microsoft and some other systems. We then started to look at um, their data layer. So really helping them work with some partners that are out there that help create kind of an enterprise service bus level, you know, data, you know, data layer for them to be able to plug and play with systems. And then they even started to get to the point where they changed their contract terms with many of their vendors to the extent possible. They only sign one year terms with every single technology provider. And they do that because they want to evaluate that every single year and see where that goes. So there was a lot that went into this change, but I think probably the most important part of it was the implementation of journey mapping and strategic foresight as their language throughout the organization. And what I mean by that is don't pick a product, don't pick a solution based on a set of features and a set of functions, start with that member experience or that user experience and design that. Look at what it is now and look at where you want to see efficiencies, look at where you want to see improved security, look at where you want to see any any number of changes. How can we use data? What questions could we better answer during this process? Build that first and then we will examine based on this desired journey what the technology is that will that will facilitate that desired experience. And they have really done that now for seven years. And what you'll see is an organization that is running spectacularly well. They have a team of developers that are constantly building new technology for for the various different experiences. They're able to try various different um, platforms for for lending and other, you know, various uh, experiences. And they're and they're really able to deliver on that promise that the CEO you know set out to do. And they're not limited by any of the you know, constraints that would exist in, in more of an antiquated system to the, to the point where just, just this year with all of the things that we saw during COVID, I won't go into the specifics, but they made some very, very significant changes to how their workforce was, was working, to their real estate strategy completely shifted, their branch strategy completely shifted, and they were able to do that in less than three months with this new plan because the technology supported those things that they wanted to do. Um, was that the one that I was sharing, James? It, it, it was. <laughs> or, or did I miss a point? What, okay, I, re- what I really like about that story is um, I think the terms of digital transformation, as we all know, seems very buzzy, right? And uh, what I love about that story is it shows and is an example of how true digital transformation can occur when change is embraced and um, when technology isn't seen as the purpose of the change but the people behind the technology and building the experience that really matters is what ultimately brings the value Um, joe i would love for you to tap into an experience that you might have as well Um, can you share with us an experience that you have with an fi it's embraced change like this and the outcome? Well, I, I, I love to give a shout out to HDFC, you know, as being a perfect example of an organization that grew from 7 million accounts to 70 million accounts with us in seven years. And they did it without writing code. You know, I think what was interesting about Chris is he had just mentioned an enterprise service bus. And I think what you really have to think about is the enterprise innovation bus. And you know, every time you write a line of code, you tie yourself to the past. You know, everybody wants to be a developer, but no one wants to be a maintainer. Um, what's been wonderful about, you know, the opportunity of technology is it's allowed us to codelessly configure new experiences for both the, for, for both the member or customer, you know, making financial inclusion possible. You know, in that growth, you know, a lot of people were new to financial services 
And those people had relationship managers that worked at scale. You know, so you're talking about a given relationship manager being able to manage 5,000 accounts, you know, 5,000 relationships. You know, technology empowering people to help other people. You know, a perfect example, Chris had mentioned, you know, we had, you know, a huge in, you know, change in dynamic with COVID of, around the world. That organization was able to, in days, literally less than a week, change onboarding of new accounts and servicing new accounts using the platform to embrace, you know, digital in new ways that, you know, weren't yet allowed inside uh, the organizations before. So, so I think, you know, at the core of this, it's, you know, are we trying to create new technology? Are we trying to simplify work? I think if you really come back to it, and this is where I sort of challenge, if you, if you take one Frankenstein and create another Frankenstein, you haven't simplified work and you sure haven't simplified change. You've just gone from a messy state to another messy state. You know, eventually you've got to find, you know, an opportunity to simplify change along with simplifying work. And I'd love to measure that in any credit union, in any institution, how you can decouple their ability to embrace change and innovate from their you know, need to go buy yet another system. Because I actually think that the issue that most of these institutions have is they have too many systems. And none of those systems get enough work simplification done. And quite frankly, banking, you know, has this huge opportunity to innovate, but what I've seen from many is, you know, it's just the same thing to, to delivered a different way. A personal line of credit is still a personal line of credit. You know, an auto loan is still an auto loan. You know, when do these products get smarter and start to adapt to the relationship? When do we start to provide the services and financial services that have insight in the data? You know, your bank is the, or your credit union is the only place that knows that you're paying more than your next door neighbor for your homeowner's insurance. But you know, it's a little bit like the housekeeper, you know, who comes to your house and cleans your house, right? Or helps you, you know, maintain order in your house. Um, you know, where is our financial housekeeping getting done? You know, how are we getting the help, not just to be aware of where the dirt is, but to get help in getting it cleaned up. And I think that's, you know, a huge opportunity as we move forward is, you know, HDFC became the most valuable in, you know, bank in the world in ratio of assets to market cap by doing things smarter, simplifying work, and eliminating you know, all of the coding that was getting done to bridge between systems and instead configuring you know, that, those integrations, configuring the experiences, and actually setting a path for others um, that is now being embraced here globally, you know, you know uh, uh, I've got to give a, a shout out to Rio Grande Credit Union. Mike Athens, in his new role as a leader there, really knew that they needed to transform and they needed to transform, you know, yet bring their people along and give them the capabilities that they needed. So here, one of the largest institutions in the world, you know, and on the other hand, you know, a credit union that was less than 400 million in assets that saw 25% growth during COVID because of their that foresight in making it much more member centered much more work simplification and understanding how to you know get out of sticky notes and have that, and, and emails to manage service you know and, and by the way in financial services not just putting a product in place we, you know financial services doesn't sell shoes the, the minute you put a product in place is the beginning of work not the end of work right and so how do they do service automation that facil you know, that allows the team to do more business and improve that member experience with products too? So uh, again, I, uh, that's a long shout out to two different institutions, but I think they're at different ends of the spectrum, but they both have gotten to the same place, which is change has become simple and efficient, along with empowering their teams has become simple and efficient. Simple is hard to do but it's always well worth it, right? And as Amazon's proven to most of us, they've just hidden the complexity, right? It's very easy to buy, easy to rely. Um, you know, how do we do that for financial services? And I think, you know, some of this has been, you know, not making one Frankenstein into another yeah. Frankenstein, but finding a way to rationalize out systems and, 
you know, 32 systems removed at Dupaco, um, and I give their CIO, Steve Erbolino, an amazing shout out, you know, as he's really saw the vision of doing more for the member, but the way to get that done is really doing more for the team member along Love the way. It. These are some great, great examples. And, um, you know, I, as somebody who has a little bit of experience when it comes to technology myself, I think that simplifying it is a value that oftentimes does get overlooked for sure. So I love the fact that you brought that to the attention of the listeners, Joe, because I do think it's important. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit. Uh, I know we're, we're coming close to time, so we might skip over a few other questions, but I'd love to talk about what the future looks like. I know, Joe, you've talked about it a little bit. Um, I'd love to hear what Chris thinks the future looks like um, for leaders and even technology. <laughs> Loaded, uh, right? <laughs> you know, I... I... Yeah, right. <laughs> I wish we could all tell the future. I'd, I'd be sitting in a different place right now. Um, you know, I think that the the idea of simplicity, I, I very, very much uh, gravitate towards. And I think that is where we need to get many of the products and services that we use have the ability to do more. And Joe, to your point, so many organizations buy things that overlap and overlap and overlap. And a lot of the complexity that is baked into the processes and thereby impacting negatively the experiences are related to the complexity that we have built ourselves and then we force ourselves to live within. And so getting to the point where we simplify and we consolidate the technology that we're using will greatly support our adaptability as it relates to the experiences that we are delivering. And I think that really goes back to this analysis of the human experience. I can tell you when organizations look at ThinkStack and they say, hey guys, why don't you come in and help me manage my cybersecurity or manage our infrastructure? And the first thing we say to them is, let's sit down and do a journey mapping session they look at us like we have three heads and they're like, you're not building software. You're not a programmer. I don't understand what it is that you're trying to do. And so when we go out and do this, we had a wonderful experience with a, a bank in uh, California last year and we sit down with their executive team. As soon as we begin building those journey maps, they get to see their own complexity in a way that they never understood. The one in California was great. They brought 25 people into the boardroom and we began to just look at their lending process. We took the most simple loan that you could give and we said, okay guys, let's take a look at this process. From the website all the way through to the closing of that process, the amount of people, the number of systems, I don't even remember, I would guess over 10 to 12 systems were involved in this singular process. It, it, it was an unbelievable just experience for them. And for the CEO who thankfully was sitting in the room who looked around and was like, wow, that's a lot. And, you know, also the empathy that was built from all the other people who were sitting there saying, oh, geez, I didn't realize the compliance guy takes all this information and has to stick it into a system. And I didn't know that this person had to take this document. And so instead of us coming in and pitching a product, we were simply able to let them see what they created themselves. And then the, the natural reaction was, this needs to be simpler, faster, and more efficient. And how do we do that? The reality was we need to have less stuff. We have way too much stuff because banks are still living in silos. They're still managing themselves in silos and the compliance team buys a software package that they think makes their life better and the lending team and the sales team and everybody else in the organization goes out and makes these individual technology decisions for the poor technology guys, by the way, who have to sit there and figure out how to <laughs> smash it all together. And then it creates these experiences. So just by shifting that, I think we're starting to see a real rapid momentum. And I'll say I'm most excited. You know, I know that people have been dealing with tremendous hardship through, through COVID. I will say that the change that I have seen in the leadership style through COVID excites me. I've seen boards of directors getting more flexible and nimble. I've seen CEOs 
become you know more understanding of what they need to do to make these changes and we're making them more quickly and i think we're building confidence because people who are doing things that they needed to do to support the move in covid they're able to now do it really quickly and that is building confidence to say hey we can do this outside of covid we can make these types of organizational changes um really last so I'm I'm excited for this being a catalyst. There's something you said that I want to just double down on really fast. And that's once you started doing the journey mapping, they saw the complexity in their own eyes. Um, and I think there's real truth to that. Uh, coming from the customer experience space in, into this one, I can tell you firsthand, like you're not the only organization and industry that struggles with this. This is a, a tough problem. and. I, I do value, I think that's a great takeaway, by the way, that organizations can start doing some journey mapping to figure out how complex it really is, not just for you as employees and as individuals in the organization, but how much more complex is it for the members and the customers as well? I mean, I, I love it, Chris, because we, we so much agree. You know, from that, er I mentioned my 35 years ago starting you know, no one had actually mapped the claims flow inside this insurance company. Understanding whether or not you're easy to do business with is a perfect question for every credit union, for every community bank, point. for everyone to look at. Is it easier for an existing customer to do more business with me than go to Chase and get a credit card? Is it easier for them to do more business with me than go to Citibank to get a mortgage? Right. If the answer isn't yes, then you're broken. Right. You're broken because, you know, getting somebody new in the door is only a temporary opportunity unless you can do more in that relationship. So understanding the journeys that your team goes through and the, the, the member, the customer go through are absolutely critical. And really coming back to how do we buff out the edges? How do we and, and you're, you're talking about them going in silos. I mean, today. You know, even just making it easier for me to do more with the institution, you know, deposits and lending may use different systems, but at the end of it all, it's still tied to a relationship that wants to add value. And I think there's a huge opportunity to simplify it down and take out the friction points. But, you know, along the way, there's new things that are really necessary. And I think, you know, coming back to the question you asked earlier, James, are, are people tied to the way it's been. You know, I think branch transformation didn't have a catalyst, you know, like the pandemic. You know, I was involved in, in the creation of web conferencing. It took 26 years for re to really catch on. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. But I do think, as Chris said, every single leader is looking at the, the future of work and the future of relationships. And, you know, does somebody have to drive to the branch or can they Zoom to the branch? Um, you know, they still want human to human interaction. They want convenience and care. Um, so how do we forgive them both? And how do we, you know, make Joe, you, you bring up a great care. point. And I'd love for us to finish the conversation by giving the listeners maybe a takeaway. I know we've got one, possibly starting with journey mapping, but I'd love for, if, if that was the one that you were going to give Chris, you could double down on that. But I'd love to start with Joe giving a takeaway and then we'll go on to Chris and you give a takeaway that our listeners can do today to try and change that mentality of it's always been done this way before. So let's keep doing it that way. Yeah, so so I'll, I'll leave on, you know, one of my favorites, you know, it's like, you know, if Chris walked in the door to a credit union or I walked in, how are we greeted? You know, whether we, you know, it's, you know, hi, I'm Joe, can I help you? Right? Can I help you? I'm not sure, you're not sure. You, you start with a question instead of a promise. I think if you really look at transforming relationships and the value an institution provides, you know, hi James, I'm Joe, I can help you. I start with a commitment, not a question. And then you've got to look at what do we need to do in journey mapping? What do we need to do in technology to allow that person on the front line to live to that commitment? But I think every person who listens to this podcast can shift the words, can I help you, to I can help you. And then look at the ways that they live to that promise. 
because I think that's the ignition point for the innovation that matters to the customer and matters to the team. What about you, Chris? I'll, I'll take it one. I'll take it one layer beneath the journey map, James. Uh, that was going to be my takeaway. And by the way, you don't need to hire us to do a journey map. You can go buy some butcher paper and do a journey map yourselves. The only thing I would say to you is if you're going to do that, bring everybody in the room. The thing that I see people really make mistakes with journey mapping is they do it by department. No, you, you, you got to bring everybody in the room and understand how that journey really traverses your organization. But, but one layer deeper than that, and it's even more simple, is you can't do a journey map if you haven't talked to your customer and your member. And the other big thing that I see all the time, and forget the journey map for a minute, is just people making assumptions about who their members are and who their customers are and what they're feeling and the you know, COVID and the fears. And everybody experienced this differently. Every single person has a different experience. And I have not seen many organizations that talk to their customer and their member frequently enough and with enough uh, or I should say in a setting that delivers information that is really impactful. We far too often make assumptions about what their experience are and we, we do not talk to them enough. So I, I, I would tell you to go talk to them, videotape them, watch them, observe them, do all the things that you should do, read a design thinking book and go do it, but it's not that hard. Just go talk to the customer and the member and see Ooh, what they're really that. experiencing. Bring everybody in the same room, make sure you're talking to your customers and your members. And then from Joe, Joe's point of view, making sure that you bring it down to an actual promise and commitment that you're giving them, which is that you can help them, not that you uh, want to try. <laughs> well, listen, I appreciate both of you being on this fireside chat. Um, it's been great. I think that there's been a lot of value in this. And I'd love for the listeners also to know where they can reach each one of you. We'll start with Chris. Chris, where can they reach you and where can they reach uh, ThinkStack? Yeah, so my email is simple, chris at thinkstack.co and the uh, the website is thinkstack.co. Perfect. What about you, Joe? Yeah, I, I invite everyone to come to LinkedIn. I'm a LinkedIn fan because we'll find all the relationships we share. Uh, which I think is terrific, but Joe.Seleski, and it's spelt like sales guy, S-A-L-E-S-K-Y. I've been teased about it my whole life, at serumnext.com. Um, but very, very much uh, looking forward to helping. You know, I think we have a huge opportunity moving forward um, and, you know, creating the opportunity for change and the opportunity for others. Love it. And look forward to it. Awesome. 